Hello there. My name is Alvin Law. Thanks for that very generous introduction. I'm so pleased to be here with you as you celebrate National Disability Employment Awareness Month for the Loblaw Enterprise. <laughs> you know, it's almost funny to me. I did not expect to have to be in my living room doing presentations for companies and organizations like yours. When this COVID thing broke out, nobody could have predicted the way things were going to go. But I will tell you right off the start, as a professional, motivational, inspirational, storytelling speaker, I can tell you it has really tested my own personal resolve as to how much doing what I do matters to me. I didn't expect to be in this kind of situation. In fact, if you can hear in the background, you typically wouldn't hear a kitten meowing. Now I have two choices today. I could have locked her in the basement, which made it even more noisy, or I could just let her wander around. That is the new reality. And by the way, I do not like the term, the new normal. In fact, that is such an incredibly thoughtful thing that we're going to discuss today, at least from my perspective. The idea of what a month like this may mean to you may be very different than what it means to me. So let's start out with a little bit of fun, okay? And this is not audience participation. I used to do a little bit of audience participation. I would never go to the extremes of making people change tables and talk to a different group of people you've never known or you know, do polls from the audience or wander into the crowd with a microphone because, <laughs> well, you'll know about why I can't do that in a minute. But the fact of the matter is, audience participation has never been a big thing of mine. So this is kind of a little bit of a nod towards you engaging in me with the idea of what I want to start with with you today. So I'm gonna move my chair just a little bit out of the way. I wanna stand here like I would typically do at the beginning of a typical presentation that I have done over 3,000 times since 1981. Now, I might wear something like this. I've gone through all of the wardrobe changes from fancy suits and ties and all that stuff to kind of now really enjoying this more casual look with an open collar and shirt like this. But this would be a typical outfit of mine. And I think there's something to be said about cliches. I'm gonna talk about that a little bit today. You've probably heard the expression, first impressions are everything. Well, I'm not gonna argue with that. I think our corporate image, my personal corporate image, all of those things that represent us as a brand in the marketplace are a very integral part of the impression that we leave. But I'm going to suggest to you that first impressions may need to have a little bit of a rethink. So just have a look at me, kind of soak in the moment. I look like a rather normal white guy who gets up on stage and does speeches for a living. But what happens if I do this? I get rid of the jacket and now you see a little bit more of the truth of what has followed me around for 61 years of my life. Yes, it's indeed true. I have no arms. Check it out. So if I was to do a little bit of a pirouette there for you, now you get to see a little bit of what my body looks like. Now, if we're talking about impressions, I can tell you as a fact, most people do not see me for the first time and go, Hey, dude, you've got no arms. That's awesome. No, they just look at me funny. You know that look? And I know what they're thinking. That man is handicapped. Oh, and by the way, I, I want to acknowledge this. I want to respect terminology and language today. But I got to tell you, it's tough sometimes for me, even as a professional speaker. In my lifetime, I've been everything from crippled, to handicapped, to disabled, to a person with a disability, to a person with challenges. <laughs> Sorry, but you could call me a John Deere tractor, and that does not define who I am. Let me show you one of the things that I have become world famous for. Check this out. Now, one of the problems with doing online 
is sometimes the modulation for recording can be a little bit tricky. I'm not using fancy accord recording equipment because that's just not my choice. But I want to play something for you, so if you can hear it, great. If it's too loud, great, but this is what I want to show you. Okay, I'll let you react to that. I can't lie. I kind of miss the applause. Because at the heart of who I am, I am indeed a musician. So let's just talk about this for a minute, okay? In around 90 seconds, we observed three impressions of yours truly. The typical impression where I would come out dressed in my business costume, and by the way, I'm not against dressing nicely, but let's be candid about this. Since COVID, if you're working at home, when's the last time you put on a nice outfit? Anyway, then I showed you what people have seen in me with what I called all those different words, disability, person with a disability, whatever you like. And then I showed you one of the things I'm known for as the guy who plays the drums with his feet, or more appropriately, a drummer. Which one's accurate? Well, that all depends on your perspective. I wanna make something very clear off the beginning, okay? I am not sure what you know or don't know. Is that fair? Because some of you may be very well versed in this arena. Some of you may even be your own advocate because you might be a person with a disability. I wanna give it my personal perspective with you today. Because you can well imagine, I have a story to tell. I'm gonna have a little fun with it today too, okay? Because one of the things that came along into my life, which I'm so extremely proud of, although <laughs> frankly a little embarrassed because I've only got one. Some authors write tons of books. I've got one, this is my book. Now, by the way, I know speakers do pitching of their books. That's not what this is about, okay? But check it out. There I am. Yeah, I know, it's an old picture. Alvin's Laws of Life. Five steps to successfully overcome anything. I'm going to talk not about this book today per se, but I want to use the laws as my reference point. And I was telling you earlier, this is my stage. It's really... Very lovely here. We live in the beautiful city of Calgary, Alberta. Been here for 21 years. I've had to change to a virtual set, which is fine with me. I miss being on big stages, I can't lie. But here we are. And I've never been the kind of person that uses a slide deck or PowerPoint or whatever expression you are more familiar with. But I do love the idea of using a little bit of a visual aid to help you understand not only what I want to talk about today, but to give you a little bit of a template. So there's my laws. That is the name of the book. It's also the list of five laws that I believe came to me one day that I wrote down as a one-page mission statement. And because I like to have a little sense of humor, I decided to use my name as the guide. You'll understand what that means when I'm done my list. But let's kind of talk about this today, okay? And what I want to also do is I want to reflect, oh my God, I can't lie about this, years and years and years of studying all of this. I am a student of my first word on the list. How predictable. Attitude. Yeah, hear about that a lot from motivational speakers, huh? I wish I could do those air quotes. Let me tell you what I wrote about attitude. Now, by the way, these laws are very, very easy to get. They're on my website at alvinlaw.com. But I want to read them to you today. Not because I don't have them memorized. I just think this is kind of fun. Yeah, 
Okay. Here's what I wrote on my take on attitude. Attitude is more than just being positive. It's a way of looking at life, ours and everybody's. It is said to be everything because it is everything. It defines who we are and what we become. You can probably picture in your mind that I get noticed. I want you to imagine how in my lifetime, how many times I've heard this expression. What happened to you? It's a good question, because I do not look like everybody else, which theoretically makes me different. I say theoretically because I would argue you're the different one. Okay, I know how weird that sounded, but think about it. Okay, while you're thinking about it, let's talk about this sometimes uncomfortable subject. I am what they labeled a thalidomide baby. Does that ring any bells for any of you? Thalidomide. It was a morning sickness medication given to pregnant women in the early 1960s to combat morning sickness and nausea. It was supposed to be safe. It was also in an era in the late 1950s when the drug was developed in Germany where you did not have to pass any tests, really. The testing done in those days was by select doctors giving out samples of new medications, which by the way, were also really new in the pharmaceutical industry. In other words, there was no reason to distrust these people because obviously you can't make a medication without it being safe. Well, <laughs> Boy, have we ever experienced the medication debate in the last 20 months or so, huh? Anyway, I won't go there. The fact of the matter is, thalidomide was horrible. By the time they realized the damage it was doing, they banned the drug in 1963 because it was deforming babies before birth. My arms literally did not grow. So that alone shocks people because they just can't imagine what would that feel like i don't know does that make sense my arms never grew i do not even have a visual reference point of what that feels like yet from the very beginning of my life because of the acknowledged information of the time in 1960 i was essentially written off I would have no quality of life. And that was how my beginning on planet Earth set the stage for what, again, is really, I will even acknowledge without being arrogant, quite the story. I would suggest to you what happened next was huge. By five days, I was homeless. I wasn't even a week old and I had no family. Now, did my family die? No. Were they homeless? No. This was a little town in the prairies called Yorkton, Saskatchewan. I take a breath and sigh because I cannot believe how that story line alone affects people's emotions. People hear that they gave up a brand new baby and they just go, oh, that's so sad. I, I agree, I guess. But what if it wasn't sad? What if what happened next was absolutely the key to what you see today? Now, I did not understand this for a very, very long time, all right? In fact, here's another expression they used for us, the thalidomide victims. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And you can well imagine there were struggles in my life. I'm not going to sugarcoat it today, although it's going to perhaps sound like that. But I think my adolescence was definitely the toughest time. No question about it. Being an adolescent, I kind of felt sorry for myself. I didn't like my body image. I wasn't popular with the ladies. 
I'm going to use that expression, okay? Because I'm a heterosexual. I didn't date a lot. And that made me sad. So I kind of had a little bit of that blame thing going on for a little while. Hmm? Why me? Why did I have to be given this burden? And then August 23rd, 1985, changed everything. Okay, now this is a bit of a cheap one, okay? It's the day that my son Vance was born. So yes, I'm a dad. Don't, don't try to figure out how I did that. Just go with it, okay? <laughs> Look, I don't want to be inappropriate with you today, okay? But I love being funny, or at least thinking that some of my stories have a humor content in them, and they're really very much a part of what made me who I am today. Being able to take life the way that it really is, not too seriously, even though life is serious. In fact, can I share this with you? <laughs> I remember the day he was born. I'm in an operating room in Regina, Saskatchewan, going through that birthing process. And I had a flashback. I did, I had a flashback to junior high school, health class. The day that the nurse came in from the Yorkton Hospital to talk about babies. Do you remember that? Oh my God, it was so uncomfortable. I think she came in. Oh, I remember two things she said, all right? This is the first thing. Childbirth is the most beautiful shared human experience. <laughs> there was no sharing. That's how I remember it. There was a lot of swearing. There was a lot of screaming. There was stuff getting thrown <laughs> at me. I'm not making this up. <laughs> when babies are born, they're beautiful. No, they're not. They're covered in goo. It's disgusting. They're holding up my child by his heels. He's literally dripping on the floor. And the nurse says to me, Mr. Law, this is typically where the fathers cut the umbilical cords. I said, they don't really let me play with scissors. <laughs> so the nurse cut the cord professionally, did the job, tied that little knot, put him in a bath, got rid of the goo. They brought out a chair so I could sit down. They brought him over to me. He was 11 minutes old. I looked at the clock and they put him here. He fit here. He doesn't fit there anymore. <laughs> hey, do I look old enough to have a 36 year old child say, no, you look great. I'm kidding, but seriously, How's he doing? I get that question. How's my son doing? He's okay. Oh, he does get this question though. How does it feel having a dad without arms? I love his answer. It's not like I got to pick. Interesting. Nobody, nobody would choose to be a person with a disability. I think that's a huge part of the emotional distraction for some people, for not everybody. But if you're in the some people category, that doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human. August 23rd, 1985 was the first day in my entire life that I acknowledged an idea. I wonder how my mom and dad must have felt the first time they held me. I was born without arms. I wonder how that day went. And then it occurred to me my mom was 55 years old the first time she held me, and my dad was 53, and yes, I was homeless. Okay, wait, I'm not messing with you. My birth family decided to give me away because they did not feel that they had what it took to take care of a baby without arms. But it was more the stigma of the time, I believe. Hilda and Jack Law were foster parents, but they weren't foster parents to special needs kids. They'd never, ever taken care of one. But nobody wanted me. So they took me temporarily, and then I became a member of their family when they changed my name to Law. Now I know, I know, because I've done this story so many times. 
Isn't that nice? It's not why they did it. It's not why Hilda Law did what she did, not to be nice. I've acknowledged in my life that there's certain very, very special people that are born onto planet Earth. If everybody was like my mom, we would have a perfect planet. But that's not the math. That's not how it works. But I want to acknowledge another thing. My mom always talked about this. She did not have any clue what she was doing. She had to learn. So guess what? My L is for learn. By the way, if you're thinking, you've got better printing than I do with my hands, I would be thinking, well, that's pretty amazing that I can write better than people who have hands. Who's got the handicap? <laughs> anyway, the fact of the matter is, that's the next one on the list. So as I promised you with the first one, let me read you the next one. Learn. Learning is the greatest gift we give ourselves. It can transform us from nobody to somebody and is the great equalizer. To not learn as much as we can is to disrespect the gift of life. In learning, we must also ask questions. That's good because people need to listen more and talk less. There's knowledge all around us. We just have to listen for the answer. To listen is to learn and to learn is to grow. Um, you know what's fascinating to me is I, I don't know, I, I, I honestly don't know if I could do what my mom and dad did. Take in an armless baby. Here, I'll show you. It's a little bit of fun I have with my, my uh, old school PowerPoint, okay? I don't use PowerPoint, but here it is. Here's a picture. Okay, there I am. Look at that! That is what Jack and Hilda Law took home. I, I know there's a lot of emotion when we look at a picture like that. What do we feel? Hmm? I'm just, and some of you kind of went, aw, that's pretty cute. That's kind of a good answer, but I'm thinking that the first reaction is usually that, that, that is so sad. I hear you. I am not here today to celebrate disability. I'm here today to point out that we need to celebrate all human beings better than we do. And to see and learn. You know, I got to tell you, I've worked with your wonderful group that has put this on. I love the name of it. It's called the ABLE Committee. And I want to acknowledge personally Alicia. She's been really helpful to me. And we were having a long conversation about today uh, a while back. And she said something that I wrote down. And I love this because it applies to my learn word. She said, we've had to learn to unlearn and relearn. I love that. Learn, unlearn, relearn. Exactly. Look, I'm not suggesting that you don't know anything, but that's kind of the point. We sometimes forget to acknowledge the positive side. And I want to tell you, I'm not trying to put a positive spin on this, but let's just, again, go into a little anecdote. Can you imagine my mom Remember, this was 1960. It's not like she could Google, no arms. <laughs> Siri, what do we do? No, she just had to kind of go with it. I'll go back here to show you another little story, okay? I couldn't hold my baby bottle. It was uh, unlike this bottle. This is a fancy bottle with a handle, a reusable water bottle, which we use all the time. Got to trust and, and trust, got to, got to do best that we can to make the environment safe, right? And trust the experts. Anyway, this is a great water bottle. I didn't have this when I was a baby. And one of my mom's favorite stories was describing how I learned to hold my own baby bottle. She tried all kinds of things that didn't work. One day she put my bottle on a pillow in my crib, laid me on my side put it in my mouth, thought I could drink. That didn't work, because all I did was roll over. Because having no arms, I'm really good at rolling over. <laughs> so 
So she just put the bottle back on the pillow and I rolled over and the bottle back on the pillow and I rolled over and the bottle back on the pillow and I rolled over and this went on for like a week. But mom was not a giver upper. Thank goodness. She just kept at it. And one Friday morning, she comes into the room and I'm sitting up in the corner. I got the bottle between my feet and I'm sucking away, having a great time. So you can imagine, even my mom was curious, right? She took me out of my crib. She put me on the floor. She stuck a bunch of toys in front of me and waited to see what I would do. She said I grabbed the toy like a flash and started to play with it with my foot. Now, is this the toy? No, it's actually a portable hairbrush. <laughs> I don't need a hairbrush, right? But I get so much curiosity, which really does not bother me. You'd think I would have got tired of it, but that is an ultimate, it is what it is. People are gonna wanna know, how do ya? Hey, I call them how do yous? How do ya? How do you take care of yourself? How do you, how do you brush your hair? How do you wash your face? How do you shave? How do you shower? How do you dry off? I have staff. <laughs> no, I don't. I roll around in a towel on the ground like a dog. That's how I dry off. Look, let's be blunt. One of the things that is most difficult about having a physical challenge is dignity. That's the problem. Because it removes so much of our dignity. Do you want to know the most popular question I get? After what happened to you? How do you go to the bathroom? Boy, that was an uncomfy question, huh? Thinking about it now? Trying to figure it out? Want to try it? Not now. Stay, stay, stay and watch, please. But try it after this video is done. I dare you to try it. I dare you to go to the bathroom and do not use your hands. Honest. Why would I ask you that? Two reasons. First, empathy. If we could learn like every human being, not just people with disabilities, what it is like to live in their life, we would have a different opinion of people. But second, you would say to yourself, sir, there's no way I could ever go to the bathroom without hands. Eh. Wrong answer. I do it all the time. You ready for this? My mom, had to wipe my butt till I was 16 years old. I apologize if that made you uncomfortable, but that's my truth. Imagine trying to be an adolescent, not loving your body, not loving your life, not sure what you're gonna do with that life, not popular, didn't date. Yeah, it was hard. But the worst part was my mom. I spent the summer learning how to wipe my butt. That was hard. And I remember going to school that fall, going into grade 12. And my buddy Doug and I were having lunch in the cafeteria and we we're talking about our summers and how did it go and what did we do and blah, blah, blah. And Doug, out of the blue, he just says to me something funny, and I'll always remember this. He says, hey, man. He said, uh, it's going to be an interesting year, huh? Yeah. Graduating in the spring. Yeah. What are you going to do? I don't know yet. You know, it's going to probably be pretty hard for me to leave home. He goes, yeah, can I ask you a question? Sure. Why does your mom come to school every day just after lunch? S sorry, what? what? No, uh, man, if it's too personal, just tell me to shut up. No, 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 say it again. Why does your mom come to school every day after lunch? I'm guessing it's not to visit. I said, okay, man, you're my friend. I'll tell you, she has to take me to the bathroom. How come? I said, well, I didn't share with him the butt wiping part because I'd already learned how to do that. Yay. I said, I can't do my pants, man. 
I can't do my pants. I can't undo the button. I can't undo the zipper. I can't pull it down. I can pull it down, but I can't, I can't do them up again. I, I can go in there and do what I got to do. He says, so your mom comes all the way to school to take you to the staff washroom, to help you with your pants, to go to the bathroom, to do them back up so you can go back to class. Yeah. How do you know she takes me to the staff washroom? Hey man, everybody knows. You're kidding. I was so embarrassed. He goes, hey, what does your mom do? What do you mean? In the bathroom. What does your mom do? Well, hey man, she just undoes my button, undoes my zipper. I go in and I pull my stuff down. I do my thing. I come back out. She does not back up. So that seems pretty stupid for your mom to come all the way from home just to spend five minutes doing something that anybody could do. Yeah, man, I guess that's true, but who's gonna help me? You? I get emotional thinking about this story every time I tell it. My buddy Doug says, hey, I'll help you. That's what friends do, right? You're gonna take me to the men's washroom and help me go to the bathroom? Sure, man, I'll help you. I don't have to touch it or nothing, do I? <laughs> That's what he said. I went, no, man, just the pants, just the pants. He goes, I'll help you. Doug, you're going to get made fun of going into a bathroom stall with another guy? Hey, man, I play trumpet in the band. It couldn't get any worse than that. Isn't that a great story? And that was 1977. Wow. How difficult would it be for you to step up and try to help somebody with a special need. I'm just asking the personal question because I think part of this discussion needs to be our comfort zones. And by the way, I have never once in my life taken it personal when someone wasn't comfortable with me, right? I mean, even if I reach up to have a burger in a restaurant with my foot, you know? And if I'm finished and I want to gotta mm, mm, lick my toes off because I love licking my toes. See, that just grossed a couple of y'all, didn't it? Look, I'm not trying to gross you out. I'm saying we all, all, all of us need to expand our comfort zones. And celebrating National Disability Employment Awareness Month is how we focus a bit of attention for a bit. You know, I'm, again, not saying people don't know anything, but you know what I find most fascinating about what I just told you? Now, at 61 years old, I can do all of my clothing. Okay, I'm going to stand up one more time. These pants, you cannot tell. They're just really, really expensive jeans. I like jeans versus suit pants because the material is tougher. Because I use the edge of a toilet seat or a knob on a drawer, or a suction cup hook that I can put on the stall of a washroom to pull the elastic waistbands up on these pants. These elastic waistbands are custom sewed into every pair of pants that I own. So I don't need to worry about the buttons and hooks. This shirt, this is not a commercial endorsement, although I wish it could be. I need to be one of those talking heads for untuck it shirts. This is an untuck it men's shirt. I love it, untuck it, beautiful. Do you know that I used to spend hours and hours and hours getting dressed to do a speech, tucking my shirts into my elastic pants with a drumstick in my teeth, half an hour alone to put on a pre-tied tie, all for a reason why, to make a good first impression? You see why that's changed in my mind? I'm not suggesting that I should be allowed to go up on stage in a sweatshirt and pair of grimy sweatpants. No. It's what I wear around the house. <laughs> Kidding. You get my point. To make another incredibly valid point, let me share this with you. The biggest challenges I've had in my life had nothing to do with the physical accommodation of me adapting to my own world. It had to do with the rules and regulations and the naivety that existed in society. Let me give you one of my favorite examples, okay? But first, let me write my V. See, I think you could write your own list like I've got. It's like a personal mission statement. You know, like companies have mission statements or this is what we do. 
This is kind of my personal mission statement, all right? My V is for value. You know, what's interesting about that V word, when I was first writing these a long time ago, I insisted that I, it came out of my, out of my mind quickly. I, I didn't study it for days, writing those laws. I actually did them in 16 minutes because I felt it was very important to trust the gut reaction to a word. So this is what I wrote about my V. Value your life and spirit. Too many people live another V, and that is a victim. It's true, bad things happen to good people, and there are victims. But the trouble is there's no answer to the question, why me? Even worse, victims often get stuck in their past, when what they need to do is to live for today and move towards the future. When you focus on moving forward, you never know what you'll discover. Everyone has value. Finding it, that's the trick. Across the street from our house in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, was a beautiful little elementary school called St. Alphonsus Elementary. I'm just finding the picture that I wanted to show you for my fancy dancy PowerPoint. There it is. So there are the three of us in 1966. See the school right across the street? There's Jack and Hilda Law. And see how big and tall Jack is and how kind of not tall mom is? And there I am in the middle. And I couldn't wait to go to school. And it was right across the street. So we walked over there in the fall of 1966. We went to the library first because they had dainties. I remember I had a donut. I don't know why I remember that. All I know is I love donuts. They fit perfect on your big toe. <laughs> okay, next time you go to like Tim Hortons or something, don't be putting a donut on your toe because it may not go as well as it does for me. Anyway, I remember that day so well. God, it was exciting. Do you remember? Hey, can you remember when you were just a little person going to school? Oh, God. We toured the school. You know, the teachers had decorated the hallways like they always do. We walked into the principal's office, presumably to have a visit. I don't know. Went in there. Dad's there. Mom's there. I'm in the middle. Principal simply looks across his desk and says, I'm sorry, folks, but he can't come here. My dad went, we live across the street. Well, Mr. Law, we know where you live. You're not strangers in this small town. We, we know your story. It's very inspiring. But the reality is he can't come to this school. Mom went, he, he's got to go to school. Where's he supposed to go? Well, Mrs. Law, he needs to go across town to the school where kids like him go. Mom went, kids like who? Principal looked at me, looked at my mom and pointed at me the first time and goes, crippled kids like him. Mom looks at me, looks at the principal. He's not crippled. Principal looked at my mom like there was something wrong with her too. Mrs. Law, he has no arms. What do you call that? Mom went, Alvin. Good story, huh? I know. It's not over yet, though. I remember that moment like it was just a moment ago. The principal didn't laugh. He simply looked at us and very, very frankly said, be that as it may, there is nothing I can do. Wow. I wish you could have been in that room. I don't think I mentioned my dad was um, an integral part of my life as well. My mom was my primary caregiver, but my dad, oh my God, I could talk about him for hours. My dad was a... Um, uh, machinery mechanics is what he was trained to do. Did it for 57 years. Cars even, you know, things like that. But he was also a service manager for the International Harvester Truck and Tractor Dealership in Yorkton, Saskatchewan. His primary customer were farmers. You never, ever say to a farmer, there's nothing I can do. Can you imagine that moment? But even more. I looked over and my mom was tearing up. She wasn't crying, but she was upset. 
And my dad saw my mom crying. And then my dad looked at the man that made mom cry. And, and oh yeah, the ex-professional boxer part. I, I, don't, I never saw my dad fight, but he was big and tough. He looked at my mom and said, Hilda, I think you need a moment here, dear. Why don't you go you know, back to the library, take the boy here, get him another donut. The principal and I, we're gonna have a little chat now. Now, I don't know what went on in there, but 20 minutes later, dad comes out, big smile. Hey kid, you're going to school here tomorrow. I was convinced my dad beat up the principal. <laughs> he did not do that. He could have done that, but here's my point. This is a little bit tricky. I want to just tell you ahead of time. It's hard not to be angry with the inequity in the world. I've had my bouts of anger and depression, having to deal with having no arms. I can't lie. But I can tell you that anger never fixed anything. Why would I say that so bluntly? Because I, I would believe that there must be some of you watching this that might have a physical disability or any kind of challenge. I understand that. And I understand how there is an unfair field out there. I get it. Can I, can I say this? I don't want to insult anybody. It's not personal. You know, it's really funny. I, I, I want to show you another picture. This is a really dated picture. I apologize, but it's just right here in my book, and I don't want to start having too many props laying around on the floor here. Check this out. Yeah, that? That's my family. Now, that's an older picture I get. I can show you a new picture. It's not the point. When people see that, they, they go, oh, what a lovely family. I know. Look, let me show you this again. Look at my wife. That's Darlene. When we met in 1991, it was at a conference that I was the closing keynote for, and she was one of the organizers of the event. Therefore, we had gotten to know each other professionally, but who knew that that would extend into friendship, which would eventually lead to dating, which would eventually lead to cohabitating, which would eventually lead to marriage. The first time I spotted her, I couldn't take my eyes off her. <laughs> In fact, she came up to me and said, you're staring. I said, I'm not staring. She goes, yeah, and you're drooling too. I'm not drooling. Oh, she was beautiful. I'm just telling you. So it might be obvious why I was attracted to her. Why would she be attracted to me? I don't think it was the biceps. See, I think that there is a way to get through this blockage so many people have of trying to understand what happened to them and put it in perspective. See, being born this way, uh, not only did I not have to overcome anything, but my mom and dad, but my mom in particular was so good at reminding me to be grateful for what I have. Do you, know, do you have one of these? Do you have a first memory? Okay, just like close your eyes, maybe just try this. Close your eyes. Can you remember your first visual memory in your mind of you as a child? Here's mine. I'm sitting on the floor in our basement in Yorkton, Saskatchewan, and I'm sewing buttons on a rag with a needle and thread. My mom was a seamstress. And since she was not experienced as a rehabilitation specialist, she did not have any experience in special education. She was just practical. She did things like make clothes with an old Singer treadle sewing machine. And she gave me this challenge one day, a bunch of buttons, a rag, some thread, a needle, and said, okay, thread the needle, tie the little knot like you've seen me do, and sew those buttons on a rag. And when you're done, I'm gonna get you to do it again. My dad, being a mechanic, would bring home nuts and bolts from work that I would screw on and off and on and off for hours at a time. Why, so someday I could be a motivational speaker and go out and dazzle people? No, because it's hard. 
This is difficult. Being a person with a physical disability can be extremely difficult. But what about the hidden ones? You ever thought of those? You know, this beautiful woman, I wanna just show you one more time here, and I'm not trying to focus on her beauty externally, even though she's still extremely attractive. Can you see her handicap? My wife is extremely hard of hearing. It has degraded over time. It's a genetic problem. She also has tinnitus or tinnitus, which limits her ability to hear. In fact, she is very, very challenged, especially since COVID with masks and plexiglass. The point is everybody, everybody has something they're up against. And how we respond personally to our own challenges is a key to how we get through the dark tunnel, I call it. Okay, so I got to go to school. I did okay at school, I wasn't a brainiac. But I also learned something else that was an incredible value to me. I learned to reconcile that I simply could not do certain things. I didn't like it, but sports was the perfect example. I couldn't play sports. I know what you're thinking, you can play soccer. I know, it's one of my oldest jokes. I never get the penalty for touching the ball with my hands, yuck, yuck, yuck. But the reality is, I had to reconcile things I love. I love football, can't play it. I love basketball, can't play it. I love hockey, can't play it. But one day, I played something else. Don't clap, it wasn't very good, all right? In fact, that is exactly the point. Nobody picks up an instrument or a skill or a sport or anything the first time and perfects it. Think about it. Nobody ever picked up something for the first time and perfected it. I love Malcolm Gladwell, even though he didn't make up this idea. The idea of 10,000 hours to master a skill fascinates me. Do we spend 10,000 hours mastering our attitude? I'm just curious. That's a metaphor. That's not just chopsticks. I, I gotta tell you, I didn't see that one coming when I was a little boy. We didn't have a lot of money. We were poor, apparently. Went to a friend's house one day who weren't poor. Mom and dad loved to play cards, especially the game Bridge. So they always were with couples. And being a single child, because remember, do the math, I kind of had to hang out on my own. So I went down to the basement of this rather affluent house one afternoon, and down in the basement was a piano. So I just went up and played that. Mom heard me. She stopped her game. She came racing down the stairs. Was that you? I gave the standard 10-year-old answer. <laughs> do you see anybody else down here? And then she made me play it again. And then she started to cry again. But these were different tears. I have a, I have such a lovely memory of this. I wanna say this, I wanna side, just sidetrack for a sec. Some people think growing up like this was horrible. It wasn't. It had its moments, but it was incredible. Small town Saskatchewan. Oh my God, my mom knew everybody. When she realized I could play chopsticks, she took me on the Yorkton, Saskatchewan, elderly women's tea party circuit. It was awesome. I was entertaining grandmas. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. I'm sorry, it just is. They clapped, they cried, they gave me milk and cookies for chopsticks. Grandma hugs, grandma kisses. I still wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat and the smell of Chanel number five. Remember that? Oh, it's toxic. One day I went into a lady's house and I, I just thought she was another grandma. Did my little concert. But then things changed. I didn't get milk and cookies. She says, Alvin, I'm a piano teacher and your mother has asked me to give you lessons. 
but I'm not going to. Why not? Well, Alvin, don't take this personal. But your toes are just short. Your toes are too short to play the piano, that's for sure. It's why people use their hands. I like coming up with words and expressions. Here's, here's the one, I love this one. Darlene thought of this one. My toes weren't too short. That woman's mind was too small. My eye is for imagination. I like this one a lot. And I guess that's the funny thing is, I don't write these down or tell them to you because it's about me. It is, I guess, about me today. But isn't it also about you? Comparing ideas and notes and thoughts and perspectives. Here's what I wrote about imagination. Imagination is the key that unlocks the power of potential. It's not owned by the young, but they are best at using it. It defines the difference between obstacles and possibilities. Let me say that again. Imagination defines the difference between obstacles and possibilities. Imagination leads to dreams and dreams make life worth living. Dreams can come true. This, I know. We need to start wrapping up this video today. I want to tell you my favorite story, then give you my final law, and then we'll be done. I've had a lot of time to think about all the things that have happened in my life. This story to me is profound. Let's fast forward a year. Now, we're going back in time a little bit. This is 1971, a year after the lady said I could not play the piano. My mother gets a phone call at home that goes like this. Hello, Mrs. Law. My name is Blaine McClary. I am the band and music program director for the city of Yorkton and its school system. Just moved to town, and I am calling you because I need to tell you some good news. Oh, really? Yeah, do you have a son named Alvin? We do. Does Alvin have a talent for music that you're aware of? Uh, he loves music. We're not sure if he's talented. I'm sorry, why are you calling again? Mrs. Law, your son got 96% on a music aptitude test at school. So I'm just calling to tell you we would love to have him join the school band. <laughs> hey folks, are you following this in real time? This is not a Zoom call, right? This is like back in the day when we were using an old heavyweight telephone. <laughs> Mom goes, like, school band, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think, Mr. McClary, I absolutely know Alvin would love to play in the band. Did you have an instrument in mind for him? You know what, Mrs. Law, we normally wouldn't do this, but I'm kind of inclined to give your son a special offer. What if you bring him up to the high school sometime next week? He can pick any instrument he wants. Oh, Mr. McClary, that is so generous. I can't wait to tell Alvin the good news. You know, he's at school right now. I know. That's why I'm calling you at home, Mrs. Law. I need your permission. You got it. I got one more question, though. Have you met him? Oh, no, Mrs. Law, I just moved to town, kind of new to the city calling all the moms with the kids that got really good marks on the music test to see if they can be in the band. Okay, uh, sir, probably a really good time to tell you that um, Alvin sort of has no arms. Hello? Uh, sorry, Mrs. Lock, you said he has no arms? Yeah, he, he was born that way. Wow, I didn't realize that. I, I, I apologize. Obviously, we cannot have a child in the band who does not have hands. I, I'm sorry, Mrs. Law. I just can't see any other way, but I apologize and I must let you go. And, you know, please say hi to your son. He hung up. Look, I don't mean anything negative about this, okay? But I think a lot of people are misunderstanding of how little it takes to accommodate the workplace for a person with a disability. And I would suggest so much more since COVID and working at home. I don't want to get into the sales pitch because I don't want to, again, one more time, tell you something you may already know. But my anecdotal evidence in my life has proven that people with disabilities 
can often be the best employee in any company. Because certain people can see the value. Thank goodness Mr. McClary was one of those people. He phoned back. I remember walking in the house, my mom was beaming. Mama had a great smile, ugly teeth, great smile. And she said, Alvin, you're not gonna believe this. You're gonna be in the band. I went, what band? She goes, school band. Let's get in the car. We gotta go to the school. We're gonna do something really cool. I gotta tell you about it on the way. We drove to the school. It was a little ways. And on the way, she explained the first phone call, the music test that I'd forgotten about, and that this guy had come up with an instrument that I was going to play. So we went to the school, and we met Mr. McClary, and we met these other teachers that helped with this. We went back to the vocational wing of the Yorkton High School, and we went into a room where they taught construction. In the middle of a room that they had all kinds of wood and saws and all the stuff, don't smell wonderful, fresh cut wood. There was a funny looking wooden chair, kind of like this, an old wooden chair, but it was a teacher's chair. So it had the right arm cut off and the left arm had a metal rod that was bolted to the side with a big clamp welded on the top and another one on the back. On the floor was a long black case. Mr. McClary opened up the case, took out, put together and inserted in these clamps a trombone, a trombone. And like a game show host, he went, what do you think? I don't know. It's the stupidest fucking thing I've ever seen in my life. I was like 11 years old. What was I supposed to think? Can you move the slide with your foot? Yeah, I can do that. Can you make this noise? <laughs> okay, can you do it in the mouthpiece and move the slide? <laughs> well, this noise came out. 11-year-olds love noise. So I played a little bit, locked the slide, and sat there in absolute confusion. But I wish you could have been in that room. Mr. McClary smiled and said, this is what you're gonna play in the band, boy. Who does that? What kind of person goes, no arms, trombone. Person of vision. A person with a big mind. I guess that's really all I'm asking you to do today is use whatever you know to understand that where we might see something one way, there's always another way to see it. to remember this is a special month for the Loblaw Enterprise but we shouldn't have to have a special month to celebrate something that needs to be celebrated more and that is the amazing abilities that all kinds of people have my last N my last letter starts with an N and it might seem pretty predictable but it is probably the one that makes the most amount of sense to me. Never give up. Easy to say, hard to do. But I think the biggest enemy we will ever have we encounter every time we look in a mirror. Yet mirrors do not reflect who we truly are. Our lives do. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak for your group today. I want to congratulate you on having a special month to focus on the positive, not on the negative. And more than anything, I want to remind you that all you have to do, all you got to do is have faith and trust in the idea that everybody counts. Everybody. Thank you.